Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is the self-proclaimed skeptical junkie, Susan Gerbic. She is the co-founder of the Monterey County Skeptics and founder of Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. She is a scientific and technical consultant for Skeptical Inquirer magazine and also a frequent contributor. She has won the CSI In the Trenches Award and the James Randi Award for Skepticism in the Public Interest. Susan Gerbic, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Brian. So, I just must say, what do you think of this tie? I don't usually wear a tie. I, I think it's adorable. Oh. It looks like something that maybe was a gift. Yes, my wife gave this to me. Oh, I like it. Well thought out. For those of you um, only listening to the audio version, it's a tie that says 502 Conversations, and it's got rhinestones all along the outline, and then 502 Conversations is imprinted with pictures of John Travolta, um, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, and um, Gandhi. So... Right. You can look that uh -huh. up. Yeah. Anyway, so, mm -hmm. now I want to put on my critical thinking hat here, and I'm guessing that the Monterey County Skeptics is in Monterey County? Monterey County, California, yes. And part of what I read about you, let's just jump right at it. So, you were a Southern Baptist as a teen? I was raised Southern Baptist. And you were concerned about spontaneous combustion, <laughs> right? That's what I read. Well, okay, so, yeah, I was raised as a Christian, a uh, very good Christian girl. I don't swear. I rarely drink. I'm just got a lot of the values I had when I was growing up. And religion was something that um, didn't really occur to me that you could not be religious. It oh. just didn't dawn on me. I'd never heard of atheism. I'd, if I'd heard the word, I didn't know what it meant. And then finally, in when I was 17 or 18 years old, in high school, the, the teacher, he didn't stand for the, well, he stood for the Pledge of Allegiance, but he didn't say the under God part. And I thought, well, you're missing the under God part. Uh, may I, I'm sorry sure. to interrupt, but we're having a conversation. I always say that because if you say something I don't understand, I just need clarification. Mm -hmm. Where was this? In high school in Salinas. Oh, in California? You've yeah, never yeah. heard of eighth? Wow. No, I'd never heard of that. Okay, no. interesting. So Please. I was trying to understand why he wasn't able to, why he, what an atheist was, and I started looking into it, and as soon as I looked into it, I said, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know you could not believe. I thought everybody had to believe. The idea of somebody not believing in a god? That was crazy. You understood that there were other people that believed different things than Christianity? Yes. And that was acceptable because well, they believed at least. It wasn't necessarily that it was acceptable. It was just odd. And so I started looking more into cults. And I thought, well, why are people involved in these very extreme beliefs? You know, uh, Mormonism and different kinds of things like that. I thought, maybe they know something I don't know. Because I didn't feel like I was talking to anybody when I prayed. I always felt like something's wrong. This, this is odd. Always? You know? When Before I look back, the okay. Yeah, when you look back, you go, well, maybe that's why I don't feel like there's something there. It's because they're, you, know, you just feel like you're pretending. There's a lot of social pressure to continue to agree and believe and say that you feel like you're talking to God and whatever and that you have a feeling in your heart about something. But along that pathway, I found out there's this world of the paranormal and I'm 55 years old now, so I had no idea that there was a way of finding out about the paranormal. I thought, well, of course, it must be real. Sasquatch must be real. There's a Hollywood movie, and Hollywood would never lie, right? I believed in sun signs, and I believed in astrology to some, some extent, and um, spontaneous human combustion was one of those things that, of course, it must be real. It's in the news. It's uh, got to be real. All right, so... Isn't or wouldn't astrology and sun signs be in conflict with being Southern Baptist? Don't they? I was raised Catholic, right? And those things are considered the occult. So how do you understand what my question right. is? Right, but I, I just didn't have. So your family wasn't super strong. No, not really. No, okay. we were in a church that was mostly dying. It was just like maybe three kids, and the most oh. of the people were. Well, when you say Southern Baptist, I immediately think something much no, stronger. No, I was raised, Southern Baptist in California was a much smaller community. I was going community. to say, yeah. Yeah, than if I was in the South or something like that, but no. So it Okay, was, so you kind yeah. of believed in every mamby pamby, not every... Well, I had, I had no way of not knowing, and that's what I kind of want to make sure people understand, is that you're not necessarily dumb if you believe in some of these things. It's just you've never, it's never occurred to you to question. And and right. up, until, up until recently, until something like the Internet was created... 
where were you going to go for those information? How would you know? I mean, if like spontaneous human combustion, where were you going to find out information that that was incorrect? You could go to the library. Are you going to see a book on spontaneous human combustion? And if so, it's going to be a positive book. Where, how are you going to find out? We had no way of searching for that. So until the internet came along and Wikipedia, okay. which is 2001, how would anybody know? Well, I think I, I understand what you're saying because I was raised Catholic, I guess, but didn't. I kind of evolved into that. Um, worse than Catholicism, I think, I evolved into the religion that Jesus is all about love and there's no bad things. And there's no evidence for that. There is, you know, there's bad evidence, at least right. in the Bible, but there's no evidence about the all loving part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but somehow I had drifted into that. And then through some reading and one thing I saw in specific, the light bulb went off and I changed instantly based on reason. And it was after the, um, it was after the internet because I think that's how I found out too. Yeah. Um, so do you think, this may be a difficult question actually, I hadn't thought about <laughs> this, but do you think skepticism is synonymous with atheism? Could you, can you be, do you have to be skeptical about that? To be an atheist, or to be an atheist, do you have to be, well, Do you have okay. to be, is atheism synonymous with skepticism? Well, there's a huge debate about this is in our community. Oh. Yes, there is. It's there's been many lectures done on this exact topic. Um, the belief is that if you are an atheist, you should be a skeptic. It seems like that would fall. That's a lot of people assume that because in our community, if you go to a conference, a skeptic conference, and you polled everybody in the audience, they're probably most of them are going to admit to being atheist or agnostic or maybe deist but you're not going to find a lot of Christians or Mormons or Scientologists necessarily sitting in the audience. There's, a, there's been some debate in the community about not really accepting people into the skepticism community unless they are atheists. So... Inter well, there's no... You there is no community. There's nobody voting, a, right, right, right. But there's been a lot of, lot of discussion about it. The way I see it, the way I see it, Brian, is, is that scientific skepticism is just a way of thinking about things. It is a method. It's, it's a process. It's a way we evaluate claims. And we all come from a varied background. We're all different, all of us. And we came on this journey. We're on a journey. Some people are farther along on the journey of understanding, maybe decarp, depart, what's the word? Decarpal, unpacking. Decompartmentalization? Yeah, decompartmentalization. Is that a word? Oh, yeah, okay. okay. They're trying to unpack the beliefs that they were raised in, trying to trying to unpack and, and, and evaluate the things that they were raised believing. And that's something that usually happens probably when you're 15 or 16 years old and you're starting to realize your parents aren't right about everything. And as you go along, you run into people that help and you read things and you see things on the Internet that kind of help you change your mind a little bit as you go along and you start challenging your beliefs different things. And so some people have started challenging God beliefs. Some people have started changing their, challenging their anti-science beliefs, maybe creationism. Maybe they were always told that the earth is only a few thousand years old. So, so I think you could be, okay, to make a long story short. Well, actually, let me, before you sure. go on, let me, based on what you've just said, it's led me to think of something. And I think that I can understand maybe how you could be skeptical and just leave that one thing aside and refuse to acknowledge it. Um, I can also see how you could be an atheist but not skeptic because you could believe all kinds of crazy pseudoscientific things leaving God out of it, saying, well, I don't believe in God, but I certainly believe in um, homeopathy. Right. So it could go both ways. I mean, I understand that you could be skeptical about a lot of things and just refuse to acknowledge that one thing. And this is what happens. There's a lot of people in the community who are religious, and yet they are very strident supporters of, of science and, you know, making sure that homeopathy is not something that's readily, you know, uh, commonly used and supported by the medical industry, or they, they have very strong beliefs and, and uh, feel that we need to you know, Sasquatch is not a real thing, or UFOs didn't actually come to the planet. And then there's also the other side. You have a lot of people who who believe that they're 
uh, how do I say it? They're, they they have the opposite beliefs, where they're believers in a god, but are well. Oh, do I already said that? They're people who don't believe in. They don't believe in God, but they will take on home. I got myself confused there. Right. Yeah, actually, the other I'm, way around. I'm more confused myself now because I just thought about. <laughs> well, I just thought about it again, and I realized. Well, if you're if you're going to be a skeptic, then everything should be on the table. Right. So maybe you could be, be an atheist, but not a skeptic. But if you're going to be a skeptic as a philosophy, then everything should be on the table. You should you should want to find out the best evidence you can for everything. Right, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, um, as I said, peer pressure. You know, some people will lose their families, they'll lose oh, their spouses and, and their children if they were to leave a certain belief system. I mean, I totally understand why they wouldn't want to. And as I said, people are on a journey of sorts, and maybe sometimes they don't want to go there. And there's no rule, there's no card carrying. Right. You know, it's not like you're going to get a card or something when you're done and says, okay, you're a skeptic, good skeptic, we're going to capitalize the S and the skeptic for you because you're special. No, there's wait, nothing wait, wait, like you that. You didn't go to the secret initiation ceremony with the Well, hands. we can't talk about that. Oh, okay. we, we're not <laughs> supposed to talk about that. But right, so people people believe what they believe, but there are a lot of people who are who claim who are atheist that are not skeptic. And we see that a lot. And those are people who are um, have really challenged their belief system in, in a god or gods. And we think, yay, all right, you're challenging your beliefs. You're, you've, you've gotten that far, yet they'll still go to their naturopath or homeopath. They're still wearing a power balance bracelet, a copper bracelet for arthritis, um, and so on. And you look at them and you think, you're not there yet. You got a ways to go. There's more things to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's where they're at. Right, and you can miss something too. Be right. ignorant of it, uh, misinformed. Mm -hmm. I think um, some a shocking example I had that I didn't follow through on, I was interviewing a middle school science teacher mm -hmm. who w had a master's in acupuncture and was an acupuncturist and then decided to become a science teacher. But he still believed in the acupuncture too. And I'm, I was thinking, you're a science teacher? <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. But then after interviewing more science teachers, I came to the realization but that science teacher does not make you a scientist. It's a, it's a curriculum that you teach because it's given to you, and you can actually go and get a master's in teaching mm -hmm. and teach science without actually, oh, right. without, without being a scientist. I was kind of surprised. So You'd be surprised, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, I think there was a, a study done a few years ago talking to biology teachers, and there was a very large well, sadly, a large proportion of people who believed in creationism. I just, I just saw yeah. some more information on that. I was kind of surprised about that. Yeah, it's, it's like in the teens, I think, you know, 13% or something like that. It's still way too well, high. that's pretty good, though. Well, it's They're lower. teaching creationism. I mean, they, they're not teaching it, are they? Believe it. Some of them are teaching it. They're, oh. Or they're avoiding the, the discussion of evolution. I don't know how you can teach biology without talking about evolution, but... They're doing that. They're avoiding the subject. They're changing the subject. Or they say, some people believe it's this. So, all right, we, we didn't even get out of your teens. <laughs> so you lost your belief through watching your teacher at school. Did you ask right. the teacher, by the way? Yes, I okay, asked Okay, and him. then he informed you. He says, I'm an atheist. Interesting. He didn't go any further than that, just Good. saying he's an atheist. And I looked it up, and I said... Oh, and that's where I, I went to a library, believe it or not, a public library, and I found a couple books on atheism. Madeline Marie O'Hare had written some books on atheism. She's the uh, founder of American Atheists. And I was just flabbergasted, and I couldn't take the book and publicly read it. My mother would have had a fit, so I had to hide it. And I hid it in a closet, or I read it under the covers at night. It was it was. I That's the had, material you hid in, yes, <laughs> as a teenager? Absolutely. I, That's and when not I went what to I the, hid, but I won't go Well, on. yeah, and uh, so people tell me that, that that's pretty mild, but my mom would have, she well, probably, porn would have probably been a better thing I didn't thing say I find. hid that. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I used to hide, um, back in the day when we did libraries, uh, where you would pass a book through, and how they would check it out is they would open up the book and they'd stamp on the front cover like this. I remember, yes, of course. And so I would distract the librarian when she got to the point where she was going to look at my book. You and were would, afraid of the librarian? Yes, absolutely. So I would get a Because few, she would tell your mom? Possibly. I, yeah, I was... Oh, wow, this is incredible. 
and I'm in California too, a place where you wouldn't think that there would be any, you know, conflict. But I had no one to ask. I was completely alone. I was my brother and sister were much older than I was. I didn't have that kind of relationship with them. Did you come out? <laughs> Not until I was in my twenties. Okay. I was well, even married in the church when I was married. I got married in a church. Because and my my husband at the time he was not a Christian. Well, I had a did. quasi religious ceremony. Yeah, because it made everybody happy, and you know, mom and dad. Yeah, I don't and, care. So. You know, well, there's a lot again. It's peer pressure. So I would distract the librarian. I'd have a couple books, and then here comes the atheist book, and I'd say, "Nice, nice uh, skirt." Or something, and she'd oh yeah, and she'd stamp the book, and then oh, without you know, looking at it, but it did. Oh, okay. That's how I had to do it, and I would check out the book over and over until I finished reading it. And then you ran home and hid it under the covers. Yes, in the closet or under the covers, absolutely. Madeline Maria Harris book, yeah. Wow. I'd never heard of anything like that, but that's why I feel so strongly about things like the like Wikipedia, because people can now access this at home, and they can learn about these things. But people who People who watching are watching this or listening to this, I don't know if they remember back in the 1980s and the 70s, if you wanted to know something, you really didn't have access to knowing it. I mean, how would you find it? We only had three channels on the TV set. Right, I remember that. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's, I, I don't mean to talk about your personal life too much, but mm. uh, so you went to college, though. No. Well, I went to college. I started in 1980, right after graduating from high school, but it was nothing serious. I was just taking classes one or two. I didn't finally sit down and take and get a college degree until 2002. Okay. I was almost 40. And it is in? Uh, social and behavioral sciences. Okay. So uh, my focus was social history. All right. So that was after. Okay, that's interesting. Way after. That, no, that's, yeah. that's, that, that's good to know, just what the um, progression there was. So let's... I guess we'll jump way ahead. So uh, you just mentioned where would people go if not for the Internet. Um, that's kind of a dangerous thing to say because, okay, guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia. You must have said, wait a minute, there's no place to, people go to this location, but this is terrible. Some of the things we find on Wikipedia were really awful, and I still find that all the that's time. That's not the only place, though, but that's the place where it's, you're allowed to edit and right. fix things. So let's go right. through that. Okay, so what is... Okay. Guerrilla skepticism on so Wikipedia. So guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia is a project that I started mm, back in two, nine, 2010, about. And it wasn't supposed to be a thing. It was just me editing Wikipedia. Wait, so you saw something and you said, that's not true. Well, I had gone to a James Randi cruise. And on that cruise, a man named Tim Farley, who has whatsaharm.net, he was talking about why Wikipedia is so important to the skeptic and the scientific world, that people are going to Wikipedia, and some of the Wikipedia articles are in not very good shape. So I was taking notes, and um, I'm not a tech kind of person. I'm a photographer by trade, baby photographer mostly, uh, young children, so I had no tech skills. Um, so I had taken a photograph of Brian Dunning, who has the Skeptoid podcast, and I put the, the, pit, the photo of Brian Dunning up on his Wikipedia page because I thought, oh, I'll try that. And I started looking at it and I thought, his Wikipedia page is awful. This is horrible. Just poorly written? Poorly written. It was mostly just like three or four citations. It was just empty. It had a nice looking photograph on it, but it had really no content. So I kind of self-taught myself how to edit Wikipedia. And it was very frustrating because I'm not very good with written instructions. And most Wikipedia training is all written instructions. So I was getting very confused and I made a lot of errors. And uh, finally, through trial and error, I kind of was able to edit Wikipedia. So then enter Facebook. Um, before you go on, so you were able to edit Wikipedia. And just talk to me briefly mm -hmm. about that, because I've never thought about seeing something that's incorrect on the Internet and trying to correct it. So there's a platform for that on Wikipedia, for people to edit things and correct them. Oh, no, I'm sorry, you were doing this one person's page. Yeah, just With one his person. permission. No, no, he doesn't have any, he has no, no control over it. No oh, kidding. Absolutely not. Wikipedia so how do now. you access someone's page to write things down? Because you could have written down anything then, theoretically. Right, but then somebody else could have removed it in seconds. Okay. So Wikipedia is completely editable by anybody. You don't even have to have an account. 
Okay. So there's just a little edit button on the top of every Wikipedia page. You click the edit button and you'll see a bunch of code. And then you just go through and you change the code. You just write whatever you're going to write. And so you could have written, he's a lizard person. I could have written, he's a lizard person. Yeah, But absolutely. when you edit something, does someone else say, this page, is it, is it, um, does someone else get notified that it's been edited, whoever wrote the page? or um, Not necessarily. What happens is when you are interested in a subject, you can add that Wikipedia page to a watch list. Okay. And so that when you, as an editor, um, go to Wikipedia, you're sitting down for your day and you're looking at your Wikipedia uh, watch list, you can see what's changed. So you would have seen a notification saying that the Brian Dunning Wikipedia page has now had a new photograph added to it. And you would look at it and you'd say, oh, awesome, that looks great. And then if you saw that somebody had written that he's a lizard person, then you could just revert it. You'd say, I don't think so. We need a citation for that. We need a really good citation if he's going to be a lizard person. And you just revert it. And so it could be there for seconds. It could be there for days. It depends on how many people are looking at the Wikipedia page. Well, hopefully someone such as himself, he's either watching his own page or he has no. someone watching it for him. No? He's not have anything to do. Wikipedia has nothing to do with the person who associated they're, they're not allowed to edit their own Wikipedia page. Oh, wow. Absolutely not. There, there's, there's no power to um, change things on your own Wikipedia page. I mean, there are ways around it, but no. You, if you, you should have your own website. That is what, okay. That's what they're... If you are so concerned about your Wikipedia page, well, that's fine, but no. A web it's page, interesting it? then because you could write something about anybody. Right. Or you could write anything about anybody, I should say. Absolutely. There could be vandalism. There could be all kinds of crazy things added to somebody's Wikipedia page that are harmful. Thankfully, there are thousands and thousands of editors, thousands and thousands of volunteers on Wikipedia, not necessarily in my group, but in all Wikipedia, that are looking for this. Plus, there are also robots that are trained to completely go in and and find vandalism and remove it. Okay. So uh, most edits uh, on Wikipedia are done by robots. Okay. So they're specially designed to catch vandalism and revert it in seconds. So most most vandalisms that way. It's funny, you know, people are really fixated on this. Anybody could edit Wikipedia and, and put something horrible on there. It's like, yeah, they sure can, but we can also revert it just as quickly. All right, so now let's get back to guerrilla skepticism. Right. So this, you were looking not, you, you started with Brian, okay. Started with Brian. Mm -hmm. And when did you say, wait a minute, I can go on and I can fix homeopathy and make sure they're citing, or I can fix right. dowsing, or I can say this needs a citation, or... Right. Well, what happened is I started on Facebook. It just kind of something I joined, and I posted on Facebook that I had just changed a Wikipedia page. I, I don't remember if it was Brian Dunning's or who, whose it was, but other people said, really, what did you just do and how did you do that? So I explained, and then two or three people started talking to me about, well, what are you going to do next and how did you learn how to do that? And so it just kind of, you, you found a commonality from friends that started you know, asking about this and how to do it. So we started an email group where we were talking over email and kind of thinking about, um, what we could do and what needed to be fixed and how to do it. We were self-teaching each other. Okay. They helped, thankfully had a, more of a technical background than I did, so they kind of taught me more how to do the code. But they hadn't really thought about editing Wikipedia, I don't think, up at that time. So it just it, it escalated. And then eventually I was asked to speak at a, a skeptic camp, which is a small you know, maybe 30 people attend event. And they said, would you like to talk about what you're doing with Wikipedia? I said, okay, I guess I got to come up with a name. Um, how about Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia? And that's U-E, Gorilla, U-E. Gorilla, yeah, G-U-R-E-L-L-I-A. Right, not, yeah. Right. Well, we, we play on the words. We, we have fun with both. It, okay. It doesn't, really doesn't matter to us. It's oh, kind of fun. okay. So I do a lot of things with psychics. Psychics are kind of my favorite topic. And so at the time, uh, Mark Edward, who's also an expert on psychics, had, uh, we were doing a lot of different things and we called everything we were doing gorilla skeptics. It was just kind of something we used all the time. We use that phrase. So I just said, okay, gorilla skeptics on Wikipedia. 
And then I did more lectures and people joined like crazy and I started doing more and more. Here I am talking to you. <laughs> yeah, you hit it now. <laughs> My point is, is that if I had thought about it I think it you're on the, the way down. <laughs> <laughs> if I would thought about it at the beginning, I think I would have planned it out better, maybe come up with a name that was, I don't know, more professional sounding. Well, we can use the overused organic term. It came about organically. It came about organically. There you go. It was... I'm, I'm happy with the way it turned out, but at the time, it's just kind of how it happened. And, you know, sometimes these things die out, but and other times things succeed. And this seems to be very, very popular and very, it, it's, it's succeeding leaps and bounds over what I would have oh, anticipated. Great. Good. Mm -hmm. I think I have just added my 113th editor to our team. Wow. So we're moving along. And. I had a question for you about something that you realized wasn't true after you held a long belief for quite a while, and I guess you've covered that <laughs> with the religious. Um, so, and you, I also wanted to ask you about psychics. You brought it up a little bit earlier, um, but let's talk about it now. How come that's one of your favorite things? Oh, psychics. Oh my gosh, they're so interesting. The whole idea of being able to communicate with the dead. So let's branch out on that, though. Uh -huh. So that's one area of psychics, right? Because they... That's psychics. Yeah, that, some do tarot the readings and Every, palm readings, It's a big but... umbrella there. Mm -hmm. So mediums, that's a very specific right. form. So that's what you, that's your favorite? Is that's mediums? my favorite. Okay. They're, they're so fa it's so fascinating. The whole idea that they can, they don't have a, they don't necessarily use a tool or anything like that. It's not like a, I mean, they could just, as you and I are talking, I could be talking to, say I'm speaking to your dead a great grandfather yeah, you could or something say that. and kind of look over the, your shoulder and act like I'm getting your message from him and I could it, it's something it's like magic you could do without having a coin or a card or something like that it's it's fascinating so what's fascinating to you about it that these people are doing it that other people believe it or we've never found any evidence that there's anything happening at all but it's 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 an interesting uh, psychological. Okay, so you're looking it, at it. It's very, it's fascinating how you can, it's very hard to talk somebody out of the belief once they have, feels like they, that it's real. And so you're fascinated with it from a psychological perspective, both on the, the, re, the um, what was it, a reader? The, the, both on the medium and the. And the, con. and the sitter, <laughs> the sitter, the mark. The mark, the sitter, there you go. Yeah. So I think. So how many have you done psychic pages? Uh, well, let's talk through one. So um, mm -hmm. you, you see a medium on Wikipedia, you want to edit something. It says this person's, um, I don't know what they would say, but so-and-so is a medium. Um, they did a great job for me. They've done 20 other people. Every off. It's all off. That's all off. It's all opinion. It's got to go. So you write in this is all opinion or you take it right off? It's off. It's gone. Okay. Citation it, needed. Citation needed. There's, a, there's not very many psychic pages on Wikipedia. Wow. Odd. Because you have to have a notable citation to back up everything on the page. Okay. So. So it's not exactly the Wild West that people think it is. Then. No, Wikipedia. no. Okay. It might have started out that way back in 2001, 2002, 2003. But now with the advent of they've added all these robots, it's become much more professional. People are taking it much more seriously. Oh, Wikipedia is not. Well, I think once the Wild West at it's all. difficult, though, once something has a reputation, it takes much longer to yeah, shed that. Yeah, I think they didn't really realize what they were going to become a thing either. But now on, on Wikipedia... Well, let's, let's stay uh, with the psychic thing. I, I didn't well, mean with to... the psychics, I don't really do a lot with psychics on Wikipedia. So, what, so, okay, how does your fascination manifest itself? I do a lot more with investigating psychics or mediums, and we do stings. We? Mark you, Edward is one of the people who's been very um, a big supporter, and him and I and other people have done stings. What's a sting? Well, I am not the confrontational type. I'm not the type that's going to go necessarily and confront somebody. I'm more of a behind-the-scenes kind of personality. So, Which is probably good because you're also recognizable. Yeah, well, so I've done several different kinds of stings. They're... I use Facebook to try to prove that psychics are hot reading, okay, hot reading. a person. So I have put together several... Uh, no, you might as well define that. I know. Okay. Define hot reading. So a cold read 
is where I don't know you, and I'm going to just state just general things about you that I can get from your demeanor, your appearance, your age, you know, are you wearing a wedding ring or is there a tan line there, which would kind of mean that you're probably separated or divorced or something like that. You know, you can see things about a person and you can just make statements and you go with the general things. You know, if he's a certain age, he probably doesn't have his grandparents still alive. So I can probably talk about how your grandparents are not alive. But if they're a certain age, then maybe your parents are still alive. There's all those things that that's a cold read. Well, I should mention at this point, I actually was a participant in a class for psychics where they, I was happened to be standing nearby and they needed a participant, a um, subject. Uh -huh. This woman was teaching a class and she needed somebody to sit there for the psychics to uh, work with. And she wanted to do psychometry, which I guess is you give them something right. that's good. So they I gave them to something, something. good. And the startling things I learned about myself are <laughs> that I have um, a lot of keys at home that don't fit anything, but I can't bear, bring to myself really? to throw them out. Wow. That I have a a box or a chest full of photographs I've been meaning to organize, but right. I just haven't gotten around wow. to it. Me and everybody else, too. Um, yeah. And then the more specific things were that I was divorced with two children and my house was messy. Now, I'm not divorced. I've never had children. My house is almost as clean as an operating room because we have a cat with food allergies. And they're severe. So you can't, my wife is, forget it. There's not a crumb to be found. So um, general information and then total misses on the specifics. So, but she got the pictures, the a oh, box yeah. of photos, right, and the keys, and the keys. I mean, that sounds pretty accurate to me, right? It was hilarious because even at the time, I had just finished a book on cold reading, and there were a list of maybe a dozen or so things to always go for, and keys and photos were on that list. Oh yeah, photos definitely. And so and, anyway, yeah. I digress. So no, that's that's, that's a, cold a cold reading. reading. And so what would happen is if you were doing a sitting. I would completely forget the misses, and I would remember only the hits that, that the psychic gave me. So I'd completely forget the part about the messy house. The other interesting I'd thing I'd only remember I, the, the photos. The other interesting thing I noticed about being in this so-called class, and that I've also seen this medium perform, is she will chastise the audience if they say something without prompting. She'll say, never tell the medium anything. Does this make sense to you? She'll go on. <laughs> but yet you're, yeah. So she said, uh -huh. don't ever tell me anything. But then a lot of times it's always questions. Right. They th why, if a, if a medium so, knows, they shouldn't be asking questions. They should just Well, when it. I was in the class, I said, well, you, I've always heard you say, don't, don't ever tell the medium anything. So I'm not saying anything. <laughs> But we do tell the medium just in our own body language. You I've learned forward, that from Ray Hyman. You yeah, shake your head. That. We're always giving them encouragement. Well, she's got to be dumb as a post then if she didn't read my body language. <laughs> Very likely that she was, who, who knows what her agenda was. But with a hot read, it means I know something about you. I found your name somehow and I've Googled you or I've looked up your Facebook or your Twitter account or your Instagram account and I can see things about you. Are people on your Facebook page wishing you happy birthday? If I scroll back far enough. Oh, so you can find friends? I oh. can tell you when your birthday is. I know you're born in April 13th. I know that because your people were wishing you happy birthday back on April 13th. If I scroll far enough, it's going to be there. All right. So let's. That's a hot read. Let's go through this. So you set yourself up as a fake person? So we've done several different stings. Um, I'll, I'll list them really quick in case the people are interested in hearing, you know, looking and Googling it. You, if you want to know in detail about some of the stings I've done, you just Google Susan Gerbic psychic. And oh, you'll really? find tons of articles I've written about the investigations I've done. The first one was called Operation Bumblebee. Bumblebee? Yeah. The next one was Operation Ice Cream Cone. The next one was Operation Tater Tot. Tater Tot. Tater Tot. And the one that I'm going to have coming out soon is called Operation Pizza Roll. So they're all different psychics. Uh, we're all trying to catch them in a hot read. Were you, so when you do this, are you, I, I guess maybe, should I ask a question or do you want to talk me through one? Go for it. So the question I guess I have, so if I were going to do this, perhaps I would locate a psychic, I would make an appointment, and I would make a fake identity, and then I would go there and see if they had gleaned information from it. Exactly. So you do, oh, so you actually go out, okay. Okay, so that's basically what we did. It's a lot more involved. And I apologize for not no, knowing fine. specifically it's, what you That's basically what happens, um, the way we put them together. It's a lot of work. I'll it's bet. a lot of work 
you've got to, to find a, the psychic that you're going to work with. It's, it, you have to find somebody who's on social media, who's somebody you can tag on Facebook, somebody who's hungry enough to go after the hot read. Because most psychics these days are just cold readers. They don't have to go for the, for the um, they're, they're, already, they're already notable. They already have large audiences of people coming to their shows. But they could glean the information without being on Facebook, right? It's easier on Facebook. I mean, they could get it through Facebook without being known, Well, if you understand what I mean. Right. Well, what happens is the, the you know, we put a lot of this information on Facebook. For obviously. a reason, to make well, it accessible. Well, for you. Well, let's say, you know, you're going to go see a psychic. Just naturally, well, even if you go to a, a, um, a rock concert or a country music festival, people share it on their Facebook right. page. It's so easy to do that. You're, you're going to tag, I'm going to go see you know, this country star or something like that, and you're telling your friends. So that country star, the event that you've just tagged, can now know that you're going to be at their show. Okay, yes. Right? right? That's right, how yep. Facebook works. Yep. So what we did is we wanted to find psychics that we could that use that feature. We wanted to prove that psychics can go and get that information from Facebook and use it. Right? Oh, I understand. So, but we had to make sure that the information they were getting isn't a real person. Right. So what we did is we created That's fake your control, personas. Basically. That's our control. And we even blinded it even further. Let me let me let me explain. It's kind of confusing, but let me see if I can do it in a minute. So we created fake personas on Facebook. They have to talk to somebody. So we created many fake personas. Fake friends. Fake friends. So we have many fake friends interacting with each other. They're sharing details about their lives and the people they'd like to meet in the afterlife. You know, their grandfather or their brother or their sister or whatever. Cat, the dog. The cat, their dog. But they also have to look like real people. So we had to have them check in at, like, maybe Starbucks or have them uh, share a cat video or put inspirational quotes up. So it takes time to create fake Facebook pages, many fake Facebook pages that are interacting with each other. And this is after you've already tagged a psychic that you want to go no, after. We no, have to, oh. you have to create these pages in advance. Right. Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Right, right, right. But you may have someone in mind, though, before you make the... Not no. necessarily. Sometimes, maybe, maybe not. All right. So you have to create these accounts. They have to look like they're real people and living real lives and having bad days at work and having a fight with their sister or whatever, and putting up pictures of whatever on their Facebook page. they got to look real. So it's a lot of work. So then you have to time it so that the information you want the psychic to read hits the top of your, your um, Facebook page at just the time you're going to be going to the event. And that's a lot of work, especially if you're getting a private reading with somebody. You've got to stretch it out until you, because you want the psychic to, you tag the psychic saying, I'm going to be going to a private reading with you, or um, I'm going to an event that you're, you know, one of those, those events. And you want that person, you're going to tag the event, hoping that they or their minions, their, you know, their helpers, the manager or whatever, the psychic, yeah, somebody to go and say, oh, here's a good one. And look at it and go to your Facebook page and get the information you want them to get. So if somebody has, maybe your, maybe your brother-in-law just died, something like that. You've created a character of a brother-in-law, and he's just recently died, and your sister is really grieving, and you're going to go see this psychic. And so that's the information you want that person, the psychic to relay. So you've got to time it so it hits right at the right time, and it's a lot of work. The other problem was is we didn't want to go see a psychic and have the psychic read, say that they read our mind. Right? So if you know that you've created a character of a brother-in-law who's just recently died, you know that. Right. So the psychic could read your mind and get the brother-in-law from your mind. Okay. Right? Well, I'll say right. Yeah, okay. So we didn't want that to happen. You didn't want that to be part of their defense. Yes. So what we did is we locked the people who were attending the event from the... Facebook pages. So they didn't know what was on their Facebook pages. Oh, okay. There's the control. So it's not on their mind. So they can't know what's... They so can't. you create this fake persona, but you send somebody that doesn't know what that persona is. Exactly. 
Interesting. So that was even a bigger blind. Wow, that is pretty good. It was, it's, it's time consuming. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of people to do it, but it was fun. And we caught, we did finally catch somebody. Well, in how many Hollywood. have you done like this? Mm, I think that was our fourth. And I so, think we've done four psychics. And yeah. one out of four was a heart read? Uh, everything You're, we've gotten were cold reads. Okay. Yeah, it was blatant cold reading, and it was... General. And, it was general. It was, it was, you can read about them and the different things I detail it, but, um, yeah, it was and those cold, are pretty read, cold easy. read, cold read. Right, okay. Those are pretty easy to debunk, too, but the... Well, huh. But everybody just assumes, you know... Well, psychics aren't real. They're just cold reading. Well, right, but let's prove a hot read. Okay. So we did prove a hot read back in March, and we haven't released the name of the psychic yet. I don't mind. Okay, so you have been successful. Yes, you don't I have don't to mind say talking about it, but I just can't say the name of the person. So one out of four has been successful, or this was the fifth one? This is the fourth. This is the fourth right, one. And you can't fourth. say because you haven't published the data yet? or We there's... haven't published his name, so okay. he doesn't know yet that he's been caught. All right. Because and we, you're using the pronoun he, but I'm not taking that literally. Well, it, could it be is a he. he. That's fine. So okay. we know well, that he. Pegs it, that narrows it down. He's not. I doubt he's going to watch the video. Well. So we have there's a there's a reporter right now who's who's oh. supposed to be doing an investigative journalism piece on the sting that we did Operation uh, Pizza Roll, and so we don't want it revealed to the psychic because this investigative journalist is going is going to be going and talking to the psychic. Yeah, hopefully that helicopter did not come through too loudly. Yeah, so we, we hope that the psychic, he's going to be able to go and talk to the psychic, and the psychic won't know at the beginning okay. that he's been stung. And this journalist is, I'm not sure what to say. Would it be open-minded? And so they're looking... No, he's a, he's a skeptic. Okay. He's written skeptical articles. So you know how journalism, sometimes they want to show both right. sides, even if there is no other side? Well, he's going to go in already. He already knows what the outcome is. Okay. And he's, he's doing the story because he's found, he's read the whole, he knows what the whole story is, and he's already fascinated by the whole idea of stinging a, a, a psychic and the idea of catching a hot read, because it's very hard to catch a hot read. It's rarely done. Yeah. Uh, Peter Popoff, James Randi, oh, yeah, did a hot read with, basically, that's a hot read. He caught him in a hot read when Peter yeah. Popoff was, uh, when they, uh, who's a faith healer. Yeah, they were using the wireless. They were transit. using the wireless, and they caught the um, radio transmission. Yeah. And that's, that's exposing a hot read, basically. We caught how he was doing it. And so it's not been done very often. In fact, I can't think of the last time somebody's caught a hot read since the Peter Popoff investigation James Randi did. It's been a long time. The only hot reads that I've read about or seen documented were always deniable in the sense that the manager of the psychic had been in the room or people had been in the room, in the pre-room, whatever they call mm -hmm. that, before the reading. So there could have been information given that way. Or the a friend of a friend that had already seen the psychic brought the... So all right. the information could have been gleaned from the first friend, even unknowingly. Right. Of course. So I'm thinking, now that we're talking, I, I just remembered another one that was done in um, Britain, I believe, and they caught somebody in a hot read. They left the cameras rolling, like similar to what we're doing now, where they're talking, and the, the medium, the psychic, knew that he was being filmed. He was fine with that. Um, the psychic was left in the room alone by himself, but the cameras were running and he didn't realize it. And they left information in a spot where the psychic could see it. Oh, and the oh. and they caught him on film going and looking at the information. And then they came back in and said, "Sorry about that. Let's okay. Let's do our reading." So they did the reading, and the psychic relayed the information he had discovered sitting on the table in front of them. There are two things that are fascinating about that. One is the psychic could say, "Oh, I picked it up, but he didn't read it," and the other one is. All, that should let off a light bulb, and the psychic should excuse himself immediately and say, I think I'm done here. I'm leaving. Well. I mean, something is left right out. I mean, it, was, it was, yeah. You would the, think that someone would realize that, oh. But the problem okay. with it is, in my view, is that the person who he's reading, the person who's sitting there, knew what that information was, too. So how do we know that the psychic didn't get the information out of the guy's oh, okay. brain? That's so, again, it would be Well, okay. let me ask you, what's more plausible? That he well, was reading the mind or that he looked at the paper? The thing is implausible. That if, you can speak, if you can communicate to the dead, you certainly would not be up on a stadium in an audience talking about somebody's grandmother in a garden wearing a hat. You would be investigating murders and cold cases, and you would be... 
the CIA would know. I mean, this is what Mark Edward is always saying. If you really could communicate with the dead, we would, this, the, the world powers would be getting nuclear codes out of you for the other oh, powers. Oh, except I would never want to use my powers for... Oh, yeah. Okay, so, oh. but now that you mention that, it's interesting because um, a lot of times you'll see a psychic says, um, you know, often consulted by the police. And then people go, oh, interesting. But if you look into that and you call the police department that's referred to, they'll go, oh, we've never heard of this person. Right, and we don't, not, they'll say, we don't have anything to do with uh, right. psychics. Or they called several times and we got nothing useful from them. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. So just because it's written on someone's bio or business card, you should still probably check that well, out. Well, and the psychic will say, well, the police just don't want you to know that we actually help them. Oh, because they want to keep their good reputation? There's always an out. You would think that actually police, there'd be a psychic medium would also be a good police officer. Or riding alongside, yeah, riding alongside of them. Forget bomb sniffing dogs. Yeah. <laughs> that person's about to murder their, their wife. So that's an interesting point too. I would think that, wow, that brings up a whole other area where people should start going to psychic and saying, why didn't you tell me? I would sue them. That this is To be honest happen. with you, I would be like, why didn't you tell me that my... Why, why didn't you tell us that there was a bomb on that train? Why didn't you tell us about Oklahoma City? Why, you know? Well, I tried to call in, but of course, I got just got hung up on so many times. Right. Or I tried to call, but oddly, my phone wouldn't work when I tried it's, to make it, the call. The whole thing is just implausible. The whole, I mean, if you, if you think about it, if you can communicate with the dead, we would have no cold cases. There would be no missing people. Right. Right, you know. And think of all the people that would have been found near water and railroad tracks. <laughs> With a number six on it somewhere that was, yeah, it's just silly. And I think that is what fascinates me and why I am so interested in the mediums is because it's so implausible. If you just even spend a couple minutes thinking about what would it mean if they could communicate with the dead? And why would your, why would your grandmother be talking about, you know, a recipe she had or that, jingling would, keys or would photographs they talk, in a box. Why would they talk in code that you had to then decipher? And they don't even know their names. It's a J name. You yeah, know, right. <laughs> you, you, you forgot my name, Grandma? You know? There was, um, interestingly, this medium that I'm thinking of sometimes shares the stage with uh, someone who professes to be a cat medium, or not a cat, but a pet medium. Oh, pet, me pet and psychic, yeah. I heard the human medium say, I don't know, she's full of it, she can't do that. But the interesting thing is, they'll say, what was the pet's name? And the pet, yeah. They should know. They should know what the pet's name is. Yeah, I mean, the I pet find should that know fascinating. Its name. Right, so they... <laughs> what was your pet's name? And that's what Muffy should know. Yeah, Muffy should know. <laughs> But Even cats know their name. <laughs> they just ignore it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a sign of a cat. They usually ignore their, their name. I know. That's what I'm saying. But, it's just, that's common sense. Why would you ask so many questions if you really are a psychic? I think the other problem for me is that I don't, I, I, I don't mean to make too light of it. Actually, I do mean to make light of it, but I don't mean to unintentionally offend anyone that is so desperate with a kidnapping or a murder or just a suicide or something like that. So some people think they've been helped. And right. some people would say to me, well, the psychic's giving them hope or helping them. I said, well, really, if they want to help them, they would get them. There are places that help yeah, grieving. Yeah, grief counselors. There are people that help right. grief, grieving people. We call so them grief vampires. False hope is not mm -hmm. hope. And so, you know, anybody that thinks they've been helped I guess I have seen people think they were helped just by getting a message that, oh, Bobby's okay, and he says he loves you, and he didn't mean to get in an argument right before. Or, you know, so, and somehow that hearing it from a stranger who's making it up makes them feel better. Yeah, what do you say to somebody like that? Somebody's grieving, and, and you've got this psychic who's, who most Let's psychics come, well, can we get rid of that? latch on you. You, get, you have this person. That right. latches onto them. You don't have a psychic that latches onto them. Well, they're, they're called psychics. They're called psychic mediums. They, okay. That's their profession. And I'm a pediatrician then, right? <laughs> I don't know. Are you a pediatrician? No, no. I'm not. Okay, so. but you could say you're a pediatrician. But that's their profession. That is what they do. And we call them, like I say, we call them grief vampires because the ones who communicate with the dead, they're trying to get a hook in you. They're trying to, to get you to come back for uh, more more uh, readings, private readings. Oh, right, the money. 
the, there is money. I mean, it's not about help. Fame. It's not about helping people. Because they say, if your if your child is missing, and um, you're desperate, you're a desperate parent that wants to hear, wants to find that child. So what you're going to do is, if a psychic offers their their help, a psychic detective. The d psychic detective oftentimes says, "I won't charge you." Well, no, because the publicity they'll get is going to be worth tons of money, TV deals. Even though they're wrong or it never... Well, it all they have to do is get the publicity. it close. If they get it close, if they get... If the child is found and anything that, of the thousands of things that you said, something was right, they can latch on it. And the family can endorse them. And then next thing you know, they're the next psychic medium on TV and they have their own show and they're on tour in Vegas. All right. Susan Gerbic, I had... A stack of questions here. I think I got to one, which is the way these... <laughs> that's what a conversation is, though, right? right? So before we depart, mm -hmm. there is one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, let's go back to Wikipedia for a second. Have you ever edited something that you got a lot of um, uh, pushback from? Have you ever done anything and then someone else jumps right on and says, oh, blah, 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 this just got edited, but that's not correct? All the time. Oh, it happens all the time. Oh, yeah, sure. It's a consensus. People have to have to kind of agree on what to put on the Wikipedia page. And so there's discussions. So give me an example. What happened? Something. Um, one thing. Yeah. All, well, it's happened many times. Let me think. Um, Something that's incredibly egregious, like... Okay, know, cutting hoping. therapy. Oh. That's where they get the... the, the, the I know. I saw yeah. it on the swimmers' backs in the Olympics. I'm yeah, thinking, the Olympics. The, that was what? that was went crazy. So the cupping therapy page normally gets about 1,000 to 2,000 page views a day. But when the Olympics were happening, um, in one day, 106,000 people came over to the Wikipedia page to learn what cupping therapy was. So that was a massive thing. So what we did is we went in and changed the uh, Wikipedia page to reflect a more skeptical attitude. And some of it was taken off. Some of it legitimately so. It was moved to different areas of the Wikipedia page that were more into the body instead of the lead. Okay. It was fine. It, there's some discussion back and forth on on maybe the words used um, weren't neutral enough, uh, the scientific words that we used. Um, maybe some of the citations we put up were taken off because there was something that was a little more citable, a little more notable. So, yeah, with a lot of the things that we, I and my team do, it's a discussion, and the page is usually stronger after other people who are not my team have discussed them and we've um, come to consensus because it really is a discussion. Is, yeah. Actually, discussion is good because then you, you, although some people disagree with this, you can be reasoned out of a belief. Oh, of course. So. And I'm happy to uh, support any psychic who can give me evidence that they're actually communicating with the dead. I'll be happy to sing their praises to the world as soon as we have that information, but sadly there, there is none. And I'll right. write them the most glowing Wikipedia page you can imagine. Great. So uh, don't expect any takers too quickly. I'm waiting. All right. Susan Gerbrick, thank you for being here on 502 Conversations. I greatly appreciate it. Um, do you want to list a website or do, do you have any, do you well, want people to contact you? I will tell people if they want to contact me, you can contact me directly at 502conversations at gmail.com. I'm easy to find. Just find me on Facebook or, or Susan many Gerbic. places. Susan Gerbic, G-E-R-B-I-C. And if you want to become one of my GSOW editors, we highly encourage that. But I don't normally give out a website because I want people who are capable of using Google and doing a little investigation to be able to find how to contact us. It's a little more fun that way because we don't want to just hand them, sure. here's the instructions and everything. We want you to kind of do a little work and make sure that you want to become one of my editors. Are there any people that you need? Do you need, oh, we need politicians, everybody. doctors, we lawyers? We need everything. Anybody who wants to come and teachers. edit for us, we do all the training. We mentor you entirely through the whole process. We have all our own training materials. You'll have a personal trainer. You must oh. be on Facebook. Okay. That's one of the requirements. And we put you in something called the secret cabal. I have a secret cabal of 113 editors that would love to have uh, more. So that is a conspiracy then? Yes, we're a conspiracy, the secret <laughs> cabal. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.